Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, let me apologize for starting late. I live in Central Time, and I'm thinking that the East Coast time of six o'clock is six o'clock for me. <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, welcome to everyone. Um, we are glad you are here tonight. Uh, our presenters for this evening are David Booley and Nicholas Flowers from the land north of us. <laughs> So I will turn it over to David and Nicholas. Okay. Thank you, Nakamik uh, Courtney and Nakamik everyone for coming. Um, I would like to begin by respectful, respectfully acknowledging that the land from which I'm speaking today uh, and, and uh, as we gather from this land, um, I'd like to acknowledge that as the ancestral homelands of the Beatuk, whose culture has been lost to us. Uh, we also acknowledge the island of Ukdakungok, which is known as Newfoundland, as the unceded traditional territory of the Beatuk and the Mi'kmaq. I'd like to acknowledge also Labrador as the traditional ancestral homelands of the Innu of Nitasanan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatukavut. Uh, we recognize all First Peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, I hope and I hope we all can strive uh, to be responsible stewards of the land, um, mindful of the water walkers who um, preserve and, and honor um, that which we need to survive and that we can respect all cultures and all ceremonies and all traditions of everyone who calls their land home. I'd like to introduce my friend Nicholas Flowers who is uh, north of here and Nicholas is going to honor us with a, a traditional ceremony and I'll turn it over to Nicholas. Good evening everyone. Atiga Nicholas Flowers, Hope de Alimiungavunga, Amma 18 Nanikiari Kavunga. My name is Nicholas Flowers and I'm 18 years old. I'm from Hope de Alnunutsiavut and I'm very honored to be a part of the presentation this evening. I would like to thank Dr. David Bewley for hosting the presentation and also to be a part of this presentation this evening is truly an honor. So once again, Nakumik, thank you. So I'll begin. Um, my part tonight by lighting the hulik, and the hulik is a traditional soapstone lamp. And within the soapstone lamp is seal oil, traditionally known as utsuk, and the traditional wick is called manik and supudawyak. That's the traditional lamp moss and the traditional arctic cotton used to light the lamp. So as we light the lamp, it's very important to remember and honor, especially during today, for Canada Day, to remember and honor all of the victims and Indigenous communities who were affected by residential schools. And growing up in Hopedale, New Nutsia, but I've heard many stories of as well of a residential school, including that some of my family members went to residential schools. So it's very important that we remember and respect our loved ones who have been affected by residential schooling this evening. And as I like the Kudlik as well, I would like to start an opening song and this is a song that is originally from Nunavut, honor and opportunity to learn last year here in Hopedale when the Pan Labrador Choir traveled to Nunatsiavut. The song is called Kuvia Sulikbunga, and it means I am happy. And from stories that I've heard, it was traditionally sung when the sun returned after the long dark nights of winter. And as I sing, I would like to keep in mind 
and remember all of our loved ones who are affected by residential schooling. And as the Hulik is lit this evening, may it guide us as we go through the presentation and may it inspire us to reflect on who we are as people and to always be proud of our roots and where we come from. Nakumik, thank you. Nakumik Nicholas for that beautiful opening to our presentation this evening. And as a settler, I feel I must personally acknowledge a difficult place and period in this time in Canada. We speak to you from Canada, of course, and we'll, we'll show you where we are. I don't know where everyone out there is. Um, for a number of years, many of us have been aware of the situations that Indigenous peoples have been describing for decades in relation to the government mandated and church sponsored residential school system. Nicholas mentioned that at the beginning. And without going into all sorts of very sad details, multifaceted generational traumas are a feature of many Indigenous communities in this country. And uh, the Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission has given us a list of 94 jobs that we as a country must take up. Um, last month's and this month's uh, well, actually, the last two months, there have been some discoveries. Today is July the 1st, our national holiday. But uh, these discoveries of hidden graves of children in areas where residential schools were located have resulted in many of us today on this national holiday, taking up a day of mourning uh, in remembrance of these children who are who are lost to us, who, who could have become elders, who could have become knowledge keepers. And yet here in this session, we are sharing in what I hope can be seen as one somewhat positive aspect of colonization. With humility and with love, my own hope is that these sharings of stories can recognize a hope and welcome for continued betterment of relationships among all peoples, ancient and new, of this wonderful land that we call home. Um, I'm going to show you a map. <laughs> to sort of help orient us. Nicholas, and I'll just have to share the screen here. There. So you may now see this uh, picture of this beautiful land where our story really takes place. And um, if I go, whoops, sorry folks, just went the wrong way there go one more there to a, a map to help orient us a little bit as to where we are. Um, here is Newfoundland and Labrador, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. We're on the furthest east coast. Courtney mentioned that she's in the central time zone. Many of us are uh, oriented with the eastern time zone. We're the farthest out. We have 
the Labrador time zone and then a Newfoundland time zone, it's a little bit different. So uh, we're a bit later on in the evening here. So the closest to what is seen as Europe and uh, Western Europe. Uh, so our, our stories kind of meld traditions from there and from here. Uh, the population, to, to give us a little orientation, um, this is a large landform, as you can see. And the population here is approximately 550,000 people in all in this landform where it's red there. I'm speaking from St. John's, which is, um, I'm going to show the other map down on the south here. Uh, my, my cursor is just a little funny down here. So this is where um, the, 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 the main city of the province is. And the city itself has a population of about 160,000 people. But I would say um, half of the entire population would live in this region called the Avalon Peninsula. So down in the south and to the east. Um, another third or maybe a little more than that lives on the rest of the island of Newfoundland, uh, mainly around the coast. Uh, this is really a, a traditionally a fishing culture here. Um, so most habitation is around the coastland. And then in um, the other area, about 27,000 people live in what we all like to call the big land or Labrador. And uh, if you've ever flown from Europe to North America, and that seems ages ago that that was able to happen, <laughs> it is quite likely that you've flown across Labrador en route to New York or Toronto or Chicago or somewhere west of that. Um, Labrador is the land of immense beauty and a wealth of life, uh, animal, vegetable, mineral, and of course, water. People have been moving in and through uh, this wonderful land for approximately 10,000 years before New European contact. Um, more recently, roughly in the 13th century, members of the Thule, cul Thule culture began moving across the northern Arctic here, where my cursor is on the left again, so across this area. Um, uh, more recently, roughly in the 13th century, um, members of that culture began um, uh, to uh, w work their way into uh, here and also into Greenland and ultimately establishing communities in Greenland in the early 1500s. Some took a right turn. They veered down here and ended up in this area that we now call Labrador. Um, and um, also the area in the north and middle is called Nunatsiavut, which is translated as our beautiful land. And this is where um, Nicholas is uh, speaking from now. So those people there are um, Nunatsiavumiut, and they are equally as is anyone else in the world called people, which in Inuit is the language, which is Inuit, uh, meaning people in the language of Inuktitut. Of course, in similar times, Europeans, particularly Basque and English fisher folk and traders started moving and arriving in the same area of Newfoundland and Labrador, following the wealth of fishing and whaling possibilities that existed then on the Grand Banks and further north. This meant that Inuit journeying, journeying south of the tree line in Labrador came into contact with other indigenous peoples already here, that's some of the peoples I mentioned in, in the acknowledgement earlier, and also Europeans moving from here to there. So our session today is about a meeting, and we might even say perhaps a clash of cultures. So I'd like to just try to explore a little of that now. Um, here's a picture of an interesting piece. We're talking about Moravian culture. Uh, and as many of us here may know, um, Moravian culture can be seen as a community of believers emanating from the days of Jan Hus in the 14th century and with a history of suppression. Their determinations brought them through periods of strife and war and oppression, but eventually into arenas of prosperity within the protection and encouragement of Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. Um, the Moravian commitment to education arises from ideas of Jan Imus Kominski or Comenius. So this education piece is interesting to me as a music educator. 
uh, Comenius um, uh, was an early proponent of lifelong learning in the early years in schools, learning in high schools, learning um, in uh, the home, uh, learning in life through, through, through lifelong education. His ideas are also still finding influence in contemporary experiential and place-based pedagogies. These are, these are prominent in modern pedagogy ideas, but Comenius had them a long time ago. Um, and this ended up in the Moravian ideals of, of the importance of education. Furthermore, Moravians employed communal singing as a means of worship and as a transmitter of theology. And so congregational song becomes an interest, an integral aspect of community, of education, and of teaching, and is a really important piece of the culture. Now, an initial meeting of Moravian missionaries and Inuit that happened in the area of what is now Hopedale, where Nicholas is, uh, did not actually end easily. A skirmish resulted in some deaths. Inuit may have initially regarded the Europeans as intruders in traditional lands, or what they understood to be their lands. But some years later, in specifically 1764, a man called Jens Haven, or Jens Haven, uh, a Moravian missionary who'd gone to Greenland and had lived there for about four years, he'd acquired a good deal of language skills in the Greenland di dialect of Inuktitut. And he decided to make an expedition to the Labrador. And there he encountered a group of Inuit near Kirpon Island. That's actually in the Strait of Belle Isle. It's kind of the piece between Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland and the, and the, la the land of Labrador. Um, and in that encounter, in that initial meeting, uh, there was a communication made through song. And I love this story. Jens Haven sang hymns and the shaman Squiliak uh, shared a song from his tradition. And here is Jens Haven's translated account of that meeting. Someone came and asked whether I could dance and had a drum. I said, no. He asked if I could sing. I said, yes. He said, he would sing something for me, and I said, please do so. He started to jump and dance and sang with the drum. I could not understand anything except I did understand this. Our friend has come, which makes us happy. This he repeated often, and when he was finished, he said that I should answer him. So I sang with a fond heart. Naleganga, which I translate as Lord Sabayot. They listened, and when I was finished, they told me, we are without words. Now this first-hand account recognizes how a social contact can be made through a musical exchange. In the hymn society, of course, we know the value of congregational singing. Uh, Jens Haven clearly understood the performance was one of welcome. And the Inuit on their part, declaring themselves speechless, speechless in this first confrontation with the humanity of the Moravians may, might be interpreted in a number of different ways. And the, the hymns of the Moravians, they, they, we don't know what they thought, but they said they were without words. It would be wonderful to have an Inuit account of this meeting, but perhaps that story is lost to us. Moravians, of course, kept impeccable and immense volumes of records in written form. And we're fortunate for that because we have a lot of history of the Labrador experience in written form, uh, at least from the Moravians perspective. But what we don't have is the Inuit experience in written form because of course, Inuit culture was at that time entirely oral. Nevertheless, some mutual trust was born, and maybe that trust started in this exchange of welcoming song. Eventually, a partnership was created between Inuit and Moravian settlers, and they established missions, at first in a place called Nain, 250 years ago this year, 
and over time expanded into Hopedale to the south, uh, into Okak and Hebron and Rama, and even up to the to the north and even up to the northern tip of Labrador. A program of uh, education ensued with reading and writing as integral aspects of that. And music also was a large feature of educational programs here in this area, in these areas, in each of the communities. Moravians found the Inuit to be very quick to learn song and playing skills in strings and in brass, and for some, the organ. Now, my own conjecture, this is just my own personal anecdotal conjecture, I'm not an expert, I'm a recent uh, convert to this music. My own conjecture is that the Inuit possess strong skills of observation and were and are uh, able to notice movement and small motor gesture and then reproduce it remarkably well. Um, I, I, having some experience of wilderness living, in order to survive, one needs to be able to notice and minute details of surroundings and recognize them and remember them. So possibly that's something that comes with the heritage of uh, living in and on the land. Um, so that detail, habit of noticing minute details of landforms and changes in atmosphere um, may be a key aspect of survival and potentially helps in a, as a key aspect of survival as a musician as well. Um, I have a few pictures to share. So this is an older picture of the, the Hopedale mission. And then we're going to see uh, an aerial view of the same um, place uh, a bit later on. It looks like perhaps from the 70s or the 80s. And you can still see the churches and the buildings there. And then Here's a picture that uh, Nicholas uh, was able to send. And on the right, in the, uh, with the red roof, is the church itself. And then you see buildings um, over here, which was the school, and over a little farther over where there was a store and some other um, uh, equipment uh, kept there. And there are other buildings in behind. Um, they're all still there and, uh, and quite remarkable that they, and beautiful to have as a part of the, the town. Um, uh, let's just take a quick journey inside the church now. And you can see that it's a beautiful um, and very, um, very calming space. I'll never forget the first time I went in there and just felt at peace suddenly. Very plain, but also um, very very uh, connected in some way. I, I guess this is a recent picture, Nicholas, because of the, the COVID regulations on the back of the pews and where to sit. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn the, Nicholas has turned the camera around and you can see here a very beautiful organ um, that uh, I have managed to play and it, it, it's, it's, it's still there. It doesn't get used much because it's needing some repair, but there's this instrument brought over in the 19th century. And uh, you can also see uh, a double bass there. And of course, this tradition involves music with string instruments, as I said, and brass instruments. And we'll, we'll try to talk a little bit more about that. But I thought it might be fun to sing a hymn now and uh, we've got some, um, some, some things to share. So let me just give one more thing. So you should be able to see now this hymn. And um, I have had an interesting time with this. Of course, this is a German text. So the Moravians came speaking German uh, into these communities, um, came with their language, with their theology, with their, um, with their love, um, and with their teaching. But one of the features of this tradition is that uh, the German texts were translated into Inuktitut. We don't know necessarily who did those translations. May have been missionaries, may have been missionaries working with Inuktitut speakers and trying to um, craft a uh, um, a text that would fit the music of the of the melodies and also somehow reflect the theology of the original German. So we have here uh, Jesu Ge Ferran and uh, a hymn that's um, 
Christian Gregor compiled really out of uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf's texts. And um, here is the, the Inuktitut words here. And Nicholas is going to give us a little, um, uh, uh, what, uh, what do we call it? Tutorial in how to speak these uh, wonderful words. They're beautiful. And uh, we'll try to sing this hymn in Inuktitut. I'd just like to point out that here is a typical sort of translation. Jesus lead us on till our rest is won. Uh, and although the way be cheerless, we will follow calm and fearless, guide us by your hand to our fatherland. And that is a, um, a, a translation, poetic translation um, that was done by, uh, I have this note here, I've lost it. Somebody will be able to tell me if I don't find it. I'm not gonna worry about it now. Uh, a, a person in the, in the 18th century, um, but I had my friend of mine, I'll acknowledge my friend Agnes Anderson, who is an Inuk living here in St. John's. And he helped uh, go through this with me a few days ago to get the actual literal translation of the words. And I, I found that interesting that they've done quite well in um, uh, giving the sense of, of what some of the, meet, the theological meanings are. Um, so it's really all about holding hands, this sense of tesiortigot, so hand in hand or, or guiding by the hand. Um, um, uh, some, some of the challenges must have been how to fit the words into the melodies. Some of the challenges are how to create words, because uh, Inuktitut has, in, like in German, a possibility of creating uh, words out of other words. So this malik is the, the, the root here, meaning follow, but it's all about wanting to follow. Um, I don't need to give a full language lesson because I don't speak in Uptatuk, but I thought it would be interesting to be able to see how, how what some of these words are meaning as we're learning them. So I'm going to turn this over to Nicholas to guide us with some pronunciation there, and then we'll try to sing the hymn together. Excellent. Thank you for the wonderful history, David. It was really interesting. And I learned a lot personally because, of course, I've always been um, experiencing the church services here in town growing up. But it's something to learn about the history and then to visit the Moravian mission site once again. So I want to say nakum make for that. So uh, before we sing here now, um, I would like to pronounce some of the words so that we can follow along. So first we have Sivuli Laurit, Sivuli Laurit. Um, after that we have Yisusi Ikpit, Inutsimi Uvagulu, Inutsimi Uvagulu, Maligumagi Vaptigit, Maleho Marivaktigit. That's hard. <laughs> it's hard, yes. Can we say that one again, Nicholas? That Mali go. Yeah. Mali guma. Mali guma giva digit. There you go. Excellent. Here you go. That's your digot. That's your digot. Ila kilangmut. Ila kilangmut. Mm hmm. It's really interesting to have the English translation side by side. Takfa. 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 Yeah. Abhut. Abhut. Ilingnut. Ilingnut. Mani. Mani. Amingmat. Amingmat. And isn't it a beautiful song? Um, I'm really, really excited about this. And you, you, you done really well in speaking. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that together. And it's going to be interesting as we sing the song because some words change based on the rhythm. And this is the first song that I started learning when I discovered that I had a singing voice last year or 
I think it was last year, my last year of high school. And my friend Denver Edmonds and I first started singing and learning Inuktitut to the extent um, that we are today by singing Sivuli Lari. So huh. this is a very special moment and I want to say Nakumi, thank you. And um, we're going to uh, see this hymn uh, transcribed from manuscripts that uh, live still in the churches in that are still extant in, in Labrador. Um, so here is a transcription and I hope you can see the words there in a big enough way. We'll hope that you'll sing along. Now here's the really wonderful part. Um, Nicholas is, is um, a lovely singer so he's singing for us and we made a recording or he's made a recording of him singing but he's also playing the uh the keyboard to accompany this and nicholas only just started learning how to play the organ or the piano uh when did we begin in march or something something like that so um with a few lessons he's already um doing very well uh so We'll invite you to join in as best you can um, at your home. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself here because it will be oddly delayed from you, but you'll hear Nicholas within the sound. So just a moment. Yay! Nakumik Nicholas, that's so lovely. Um, it's such a wonderful tradition and you can now picture yourselves in that lovely church singing this beautiful hymn um, and joining in that song uh, as a congregation with four-part harmony, um, possibly an organ accompanying it, maybe strings accompanying it, maybe a brass band accompanying it. And it's a really quite a moving experience, I'm sure. And we can all imagine that experience. And we'll have that experience again someday at a hymn society conference, I know. Um, I'd like to share, just wanna see my list here and <laughs> make sure I'm not going in the wrong order. Yes, I'm gonna share another uh, person singing now. Uh, just to give a, a, a sense of the tradition. So this is a young, we've just heard a young uh, Inuk in, from this tradition, and I'm going to show now 
um, the um, the brass band tradition. Um, the uh, Moravians brought their love of, of brass instruments to the cultures of the coast in Labrador and taught the people to play these instruments and they you can imagine the temperature <laughs> and uh, here we see some snow and uh, the temperatures get very cold in the winter and these instruments are played anyway um, people became very proficient at uh, playing trumpet uh, trombones tubas and baritones and you can still find these instruments in some of the communities and they're still a tradition so this is i think the name brass band that is still going, it still happens um, in Nain. Nain is a community to the north of where Nicholas is. Um, uh, here is, um, you can see the, the band up on the roof of the church. And so often they will play up there uh, for special occasions, maybe I guess Nicholas for um, Christmas or Easter, or I don't know when other times might happen on specific Sundays might, might be there. And on the left, you see uh, a man waving from the window of the tower of the church here. And this man is a, a lovely person who unfortunately I've only met in his recordings. His name is Kerry Obed, and he was a member of the main, main brass band. Uh, I don't believe he ever traveled far away from Nain other than around it. Uh, he learned all of his musical skills from the church, through the church, through the inheritance of this tradition. Uh, Kerry died about uh, maybe three years ago, rather quickly, rather suddenly, but happily, in one sense, there was a recording made of him. So I'm going to play him singing. And that you can hear uh, the, the sort of tradition of the brass as well as of another, another tenor. Uh, and you'll recognize this hymn, I think. Uh, you may want to sing along, um, and, uh, but maybe you'd like to listen to Kari do it as well. And so here we go with this one, I hope. hear uh, this lovely brass choir, this brass band tradition, um, you may, if you're a, a practicing church musician, you may find these hymns kind of slower than we might experience in some other uh, versions of them. Um, it's quite lovely to sing slowly um, and, and really ingest in the words and let the words seep through you and let the sound seep through you and I, that's one of the things that I've rather loved whenever I've experienced personally any of the Inuit Moravian traditions uh, and I've only done this a little bit um, in some ways but it's so wonderful to immerse in time. Um, and so I'll stop there. I've invited Nicholas to talk a little bit about his experience as, a, as an Inuk growing up in the church um, with this music, with this tradition, and um, a little bit about that acquisition of language. So Nicholas, I'll turn it over to you for a bit. Thank you. Nikomik. Nikomik, David, for the beautiful song that you played from Mr. Kariobed. It certainly is nice to hear 
the brass band played as well. The Moravian Church has been a very important part of growing up in Hopedale. And I'm sure it's been very important for many, many years and generations. And I know it will be for years to come. Growing up, I've always attended Moravian Church services with my family here in Hopedale on a regular Sunday basis. And I think it's hearing the hymns being sung and the songs being played and the organ that really, um, really sparked my interest when I heard that there was going to be an organ project taking place virtually from Dr. David Bewley and Dr. Tom Gordon. So as soon as I heard about this experience, I wanted to take part and try my hardest to carry on the traditions that have been taught by the Moravian Church to Inuit in our communities. And so far it's been amazing. I can't express how much I've learned already. And when it comes to Moravian hymns, one thing we've noticed a lot is that a lot of the hymns are translated. Just about everyone that, I think everyone that we've done is translated both in English and in Inuktitut. And when it comes to learning a new language, I've really noticed that the songs have helped because song in a rhythm helps to break down words into more simpler, um, simpler pieces that can be understood. And last year, in my last year of high school, I became very inspired and interested in the Inuktitut language, especially knowing that our communities will need teachers someday to teach to the future generation. And although I'm not fluent in Inuktitut yet, I've learned so much within the last couple of years. And the Moravian church has definitely been one of the biggest helps because each Sunday, not only is there an English service at 11 o'clock on a regular basis, there's an Inuktitut service and the service is all in Inuktitut. The songs are Inuktitut, the sermon, the messages, the texts, and our elders and chapel servants here in town lead the services. So I'm very honored and thankful to have this opportunity each week. And when I do have the availability to go, I attend both just to learn and sing and take part in the congregation. And it's been a very important part of who we are as a community all along the Nunatsiavut Coast. Not only do the Moravian Church provide our amazing church services and celebrations during Christmas and Easter, but also for many years, there's been celebrations for young people that we celebrate on Young People's Day. And this is the last day of, or the last Saturday in January in the winter time. And this is when young people from the age 13 and up until they aren't married get together and they enjoy a day. It's called Ululusiuk, and that's a day to celebrate. And I remember taking part in it a couple of years ago, and we all walked down to the church together and we took in the church service and the singing and the music. And it was a very important part of our celebration and heritage. And it really helps um, youth to be proud of who they are and to take pride in their culture through music, through song, and also through the church. And not only is there Young People's Day, but there's Children's Day, there's Married People's Day, Widow's Day as well. And it's a really important part of our communities. And I know that as we learn growing up about the Moravian history, it's really important to know that this history is still taking place in our everyday lives. And not only through the music, which will always be alive as long as it is played, but through the celebrations and through our church that, like David mentioned, is being kept up really well by our, travel, our chapel servants in town. And it's been an amazing opportunity to learn the language because also the Moravian Mission Complex is, I think it's going to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And from the sites around Hopedale, including the Mission Complex, there are signs put up near the buildings explaining what they are and translated into Inuktitut. So whenever I have the chance, I'd like to read those as well. And um, yeah, it's been an amazing experience. Uh, 
in church, I also love to read when I'm asked by the chapel servants and our ministers to read from the Bible in English and Inuk to do it sometimes, depending on the servants. And also, since taking the organ courses with the Community Music Literacy in Coastal Labrador Project this past year, I've had the encouragement and inspiration to play in church. So I've also been honored to play with the help of our organist, Nicole Shaglu. And it's been a very welcoming environment because getting to play really reflects on the experiences that our grandparents, our great grandparents and ancestors must have felt because it's the same place, the same church and the same traditions that are being carried on and will be carried on in the future. So it's definitely looking into a bright future when it comes to revitalizing the language and through the living music will be a great way to continue that. Okay. Finding my mute button. Nakumik, uh, Nicholas, that's so, you're always so eloquent. I, I love listening to Nicholas speak because he's so uh, marvelously uh, worded. Um, Nicholas talked about Tom Gordon. Uh, Dr. Tom Gordon is a colleague of mine at Memorial University where I teach and um, Tom, Tom was a former Dean of Music and now is a professor emeritus. He's done a lot of research on the coast of Labrador um, in this whole tradition. Um, I'm going to read a couple of quotations from him and just to um, help put some more context on what we're talking of here. Um, uh, he has written hymns and anthems, and this comes back to this um, ongoing tradition that the Moravians have, have fostered and, and an important piece of maintaining culture. Uh, hymns and anthems were translated into Inuktitut and performed across the coast, as we've heard, in Nain and Hopedale and Hebron, uh, another community uh, to the north of uh, Nain, and Olkak. Um, those last two communities are no longer um, inhabited. One of them was more or less decimated in the, the pandemic in 1918. The Spanish flu swept through the, the community and uh, many people, almost everyone died. And the other one was, um, we have had in Newfoundland and Labrador a, a process sometimes of smaller communities being um, relocated. It, it's never a very nice experience for the people that are relocated. Um, and uh, it's, it's done for issues of, of healthcare and, um, and uh, communication off, often. Uh, I don't think it's really happening that much anymore, but it still does get, it raises its head every now and then. So um, that relocation is, an, is one of the reasons those were um, closed down as well. But in spite of that, each church had its own choir in those four communities and, and beyond, and they had a small orchestra. And uh, Tom says, over time, the Inuit musicians transformed this imported music, this German stuff, into something that was truly an expression of their own church and their own culture and their, their everyday life. And as you've heard Nicholas talking about, this is very important to the people still in these communities. Um, he also writes, Tom writes this, it's fascinating and suggests to me Inuit agency in the face of colonialism. So this is an important feature. Um, often the idea of an imposition of, of culture from Europe on in indigenous cultures here is, is uh, challenging and difficult, as I mentioned before, and has had some terrible results. But in that face, the Inuit, um, maybe because of their resilience, uh, are able to um, take ownership of this and, and let it be something that's of value. Um, there, are only, there are over 25,000 manuscript pages of music that were once familiar and unique. Music handed down through the generations and recorded in Inuktitut, 25,000 pages of music. That's a lot of stuff. And so these are really wonderful legacies that, that stay in the tradition, if you like. I'm just gonna share a screen again. And there we are, good. And I wanna do this. I'd like to introduce a few of the people that preserved that. Sorry, there we have this. Here's another hymn. Um, this is a, an, Inuk, an Inuk 
composed him, we think. We're not quite sure who did it, who wrote it, but uh, it's something written in um, the, the Labrador Coast. And it's a very popular hymn, very important hymn, as you can see for Palm Sunday. Here, there are only uh, two verses here, but uh, I think there are, I, I've sung something like 14 verses of it in some version of it. So there, it, it, it has very many uses throughout Holy Week, very important, but it's a locally composed piece of music. Let me just, I think it's being done. Interestingly enough, we, we uh, made this recording, a, a recording of this um, to share with this project that Nicholas was mentioning, and I played it much slower. And then um, Vinnie Anderson, who's a, a wonderful um, singer, a very, very fine soprano in Nain in their church, she said, oh, that's far too slow. We do it way faster in Nain, so we had to speed it up. <laughs> so now it's a little faster <laughs> than some of those others that you heard. Uh, I thought that was very funny. <laughs> so always go with the local tradition. Um, here are some photographs, uh, a photograph on the left of a young, you can see the, the, the little girl on the left there is a, is a settler person and the, the little boy on the right his name is Jeremiah Sillet, and here he is playing uh, a horn uh, on the side. He was a fine, fine musician, and so I'm showing these, I'm going to show you three. Maybe one of these folks is the composer of Irnik that we just heard there, um, and so I'll read a little story from uh, Tom Gordon about Mr. Sillet, uh, Jeremiah Sillet of Okak was one of the first Inuk musician leaders for whom a three-dimensional portrait emerges. Samuel K. Hutton, a medical missionary who opened a hospital in Okak early in the 20th century, expressed profound admiration for the personal integrity of our organist, who can render classical tunes from the, the oratories for voluntaries in church who can play any instrument in the band that he chooses. So that's just a little bit about Jeremiah Sillet. He uh, was a fine choir director as well. Uh, the main choir under his son's direction actually traveled here to uh, St. John's in the, in the 60s, which would have been a big deal for people. It's, it's a long way and very uh, arduous journey and difficult. So, um, so that's a marvelous tradition there. Um, uh, we, could, we could share lots of others. Uh, here are a couple more. Um, on the left, we have Nathan uh, Fried, and uh, here's uh, a little bit of history of him. Nathan Fried, or Nathan Fried, already as a teenager, Nathan Fried was recognized as a man of spiritual depth and a leader. He became a chapel servant in 1921 and eventually Hopedale's chief elder. In 1923, he was a widower with five children. Nathan went to Nain to marry Louise Webb. In her 1978 memoir, Louisa remembered their hurried courtship in light of his dedication to responsibility as Hopedale's organist. So Nathan played that organ that you saw a little earlier in Hopedale. We got married in 1923, I think. This is his wife uh, speaking. Nathan came down to Nain 
And although Maine is north, here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we always say north is down and uh, south is up. It's just the way we are. Uh, so he came down to Maine. Uh, sorry, I interjected that. I didn't mean to do that. Um, he came down to Maine. Uh, I got lost here. Uh, and around the 12th of March, and he was in a hurry to go away. Father wanted him to stay for Easter because it was the last time for me being home for Easter. But he wouldn't stay. He said he had got to go because he was the only one who could play the organ in Hopedale and he looked out for all the instruments, the choir and all that. He couldn't stay and I was half sorry. We went away on the 17th of March. We got to Hopedale at three o'clock in the afternoon the next day and my husband went to the four o'clock service right away. So he had a whole hour at home and then he went off to work. In 1950, Moravian missionary Bridget Schloss arrived in Labrador. Her first impression of what would become her new home was thanks to hearing Nathan play the organ. And she writes, they took us to the church in Hopedale and there was Nathan Freed. He played with all the love in the world. It was just so, so beautiful. He sat at that organ and played. He was very quiet spoken, but beautiful. You know, it was so felt, it was real. And the that was one of my first impressions of Labrador, hearing Nathan play, and I will never, ever forget it. So it's like that's a lovely story of that, again, that sense of singing welcome or musical welcome. And uh, I, I know if you could go to these churches, you would feel that same welcome. Um, the person on the right is Levi Notasak. And here's a little quotation about him. The northernmost and most isolated of the Labrador settlements was Hebron. Uh, Hebron is just a little south of uh, the, the National Park at the top of Labrador. Uh, I think you can still see the buildings. I believe they're, they're still there and you can tour them if you, if you can get yourself to uh, Torngat National Park. Um, at the time the station was closed in 1959, that was in the relocation, there were six, six organists among its 247 residents. That's not a bad record. A choir that numbered in the dozens, a brass band, and a small string orchestra that accompanied the choral anthems. The leader of the Hebronimuit, eh, that's hard for me, Hebronimuit, uh, a leader of every sense, was Levi Notasag. Motosak had moved from Ramah to Hebron sometime after the Ramah station closed, trekking the more than 60 mile route overland. Once in Hebron, he began to assume an increasingly important role in musical and community life. The vast majority of the 5,000 pages of music manuscript in the Hebron collection that are in, in book hand are his work, 5,000 pages of manuscript. Think about that. His youngest son, Simeon, remembers his father as a superior and exacting musician. Every member of the choir had to be able to read music. It was taught first through the reading of hymns or melodies in four parts, graduating to complex anthems. So these are all from an article by Tom Gordon called Leader of the Band in a local publishing uh, volume called Newfoundland Quarterly um, from that 2013. Uh, it's quite a tradition. Um, I'd like to just share a few more things. I'm expecting we're probably running over time, so I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, just a few more pictures to share. And here is, and Courtney, just interrupt me if you want me to stop, <laughs> but we, we got started a little late. Uh, here's a picture of uh, uh, the uh, choir and uh, string orchestra. I think this is the Nain Choir, as I recall. Yeah. And, uh, in, in traditional, Nicholas, what's the name of the, of the uh, traditional costume or the traditional coat there? You're wearing one too. Zilapak. Zilapak, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, they're, when, and when are they acquired? When do you get that? Um, any, any time really, usually worn for special occasions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're very beautiful and uh, yeah. Um, so there's the main choir. Um, here are some manuscripts. I, I, I was able to locate a few here. I uh, unfortunately don't quite have access to all of the 
Uh, Tom Gordon has collated quite a lot of um, these in microfiche, but we're, we're not able to get in and use that set series right now because of the pandemic still, but uh, we'll, we'll be at that soon. But here you'll notice a couple of uh, pieces that you might recognize. Um, if you um, have a look at the one on the left, if I just play the opening series of uh, pitches, it's the violin part. And you might recognize that as something like, piece of Mozart there that found its way into coastal Labrador, um, reconstructed with Inuktitut words, uh, slightly different than Ave Verum, of course, uh, would need to be in terms of Moravian theology, but uh, a lovely, a lovely anthem that choirs would learn. And so probably a very early performance of Mozart in North America um, probably brought um, over just after it was composed and reconstructed in Inuktitut and then written out, as you can see here. Uh, the one on the right is an anthem from um, Messiah with uh, Inuktitut um, language written in underneath. And this is, uh, I know that my Redeemer liveth, which of course one would hear at Easter time. I don't have a recording of this, but I thought I'd share just a little snippet of a, a marvelous Inuk soprano, um, her name is Diantha Edmonds, and she uh, participated in a, in a really interesting project earlier, or last year, called Messiah Complex, and sang uh, How Beautiful Are the Feet in Inuktitut, again from this same source uh, that you're looking at here. So let me just play you that. Uh, now, how do I start this one? Let's just see. Good. Um, and uh, Diantha's father grew up in Hopedale, so had that whole tradition there, and uh, she was uh, fortunate enough to be able to inherit that as well. A wonderful singer, and so uh, look up Diantha Edmonds. She'll, she's got a lovely website, and she'll have more information there about herself. Um, I don't want to uh, feel like we're... Um, truncating things too much, but I know that we're probably up to our limit of time, but I thought it might be nice to maybe sing one more hymn together. Nicholas, would you mind giving us a little, maybe we could just do the first verse of this one, and could you give us a, a short um, uh, tutorial on this pronunciation? Sure. So this is one we always sing for our offering here at church every Sunday. <clears throat> and the Inuktitut pronunciation would be Naliga Nako Rivlute Huyagina Rivaptige Huyagina Ingili Nilit Pinguti Nangi Pinguti Nangi Sangit Sainatut. Sangit Sainatut. That's hard. Hilang me. Hilang me. I like how the, 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 the capital K's have a, a slightly uh, fricative sound, hey? Sort of a hilang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And you did a really good nakumik. That's great. Here you are, Luke. So I, would I, you like I, to do the second two? Or? 
it's hard. Let's just do that first verse. And okay. we'll, let's try to sing it together. And so I'll play here on the piano. You'll you'll be interested, those of you who are organists, you'll be fascinated by the, the key of this one. <laughs> so here we go. Um, Hold those longer. very high for tessitura for those of us who are real basses and altos <laughs> but it's uh the key in which it shows up in the in the coast so we'll we'll know that i'll show a, a couple more hymns um just to say that it's not all german tradition uh the, a lot of of course these these tunes were brought with the german missionaries but missionaries also came or or uh, chapel um, leaders came from the united states from probably from the bethlehem area and maybe elsewhere uh, so brought then some other um, traditions. So uh, we probably all heard this one in Sunday school. And so uh, I, I haven't sung that since I was a little child, but it's such a lovely hymn <laughs> to do. And, um, and of course, it's interesting, isn't it, Nicholas, to have that sense of candles and lights. And uh, I'm sure that has a, a, an emotional connection when, um, when lights are so important in the North, especially in the winter. So Definitely. And it always reminds me of the beautiful candlelight service during Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. Every year, the entire community has to gather in two separate services just so that the church isn't too packed because everybody loves the candlelight service on Christmas Eve. And this yeah. is one of our favorite hymns to sing. Yeah. And everyone at the whole village where the whole town would go, I guess, to the chapel service uh, on, on Christmas. Yeah, definitely. And there's, of course, all the lovely hymns of, uh, of, that we know from Christmas are important in, in, the, in, in Inuktitut as well. So. Um, there, there. Here's another one. Um, I think, yep. So, uh, what's kind of lovely is, in in some way, that these hymns are are uh, loved and known and given names by the melodies they are given names by the the words. Um, uh, when I joined the project for the teaching of the piano. As a hymnologist, I'm also always excited by who wrote this stuff and, and uh, where did this all come from. And uh, but in a sense, the 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 generation of this hymn comes from within the culture, and so uh, it, it, the 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 authorship is not always known or 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 one worried about in some ways. So uh, a bit of Brad Ray here. Let's try singing this together too. So, Ilanaka Yisutut. I think I got that more or less correct. Did I? <laughs> you can <laughs> leave it, Nicholas. Let's try it. One, two, I'll do the end. Yeah, 
neat. Such wonderful, um, such wonderful words <laughs> to have there. Um, I think that brings us to a place of seeing uh, Nakumik to all of you for coming. You may have some questions which we can try to answer. Um, I don't know that we'll have them, but we'll, we can try to do that if we can. So if there's some questions you'd like to ask. Um, and I, I really want to thank and say Nakumik, which means thank you, uh, to Courtney for uh, hosting this event. And a special thanks to, um, to uh, Nicholas's mom, Valerie, the, the marvelous mom in the background who's tending the, 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 the kulik there. Uh, because Nicholas, tell us about how it needs to be tended. Yes, it's definitely important to tend the kulik. So Nakumik Ananaga, thank you to my mom, Valerie, for her patience today. And <laughs> it's very important because the kulik uh, wick itself needs to con continuously be dampened with oil so that just the oil itself burns. And uh, I think I learned in school as well that when a young lady or anyone who is lighting the khulik is ready to tend the khulik, then they're ready to be on their own in the world. So, nakumik, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and cool. also thank you, nakumik to Courtney very much and to the hymn society. And thank you, David and Nicholas and Valerie. Um, for this, as one participant said, a fascinating and informative presentation. I learned a lot tonight. <laughs> uh, we do have one question. Uh, someone wants to know who the maker of the organ is in the church. That's great. And you know, I, oh, I, I did take a photograph of it. I'm just wondering where it, that it, because I might have the answer to that. I don't have it in my head exactly what it is. Let me just find something here. Um, give me a moment to do that. And if there are any other questions while I'm looking here, that would be good. Because I think I have a picture of the organ keyboard. If you have other questions, just put them in the chat box. Here we go. Uh, -da -da -da. I, do, I did play it a little bit, so I'll see if I can share that with you. Uh, sorry, here we go. I don't think the, as I recall, I don't believe that the instrument had a um, thing, but I can show some photographs here. Just give me a minute to share back the screen. It always just takes a bit of time to do. So I'm going to share this screen, share that one. So I'm now sharing a different screen. So be patient with that. So this is about the organ. Here's a, can you see that? Yeah. So there's a picture of the keyboard itself. Um, the organ isn't, Nicholas, the organ isn't used very much anymore, I think. Huh? No, actually, I can't recall uh, ever hearing it like being played. Uh, right. Actually, in the church service, we have an electronic keyboard now, but yeah. it will be great to hear it one of these days. Yeah, of course, the, the climate is, is challenging. And uh, this instrument has a, when I did turn it, there is a, an electric blower I've been attached sort of back over in here. And when I did turn it on, uh, there were probably eight ciphers in it. So I was able to, um, ciphers are when, for those who don't know that, when when pipes play when without wanting to be played. Um, but I did, I had to hear what it was. So I, I moved those pipes out of the way and um, was able to, to try the organ. Um, but I don't think it had a maker stamped on it that I recall. I'm just, I'm now going to see if I can show another picture there. That's a, a bit of a scroll, a bit of design. So that may be a hint to the maker. I didn't, frankly, didn't want to crawl around inside the instrument too much because um, it's very, uh, uh, I didn't want to hurt it. <laughs> uh, there's another picture of the whole instrument. So played on the side, the pipes are, of course, are um, facing the congregation. Uh, that's a picture of the hats, <laughs> traditional hats and some coats there. So. Here are the figures of the, so it's a two foot and a four foot, an eight foot and another eight foot, a gedacht and a silicione. So um, just a very basic instrument. I th think I'm just, there's some pipe work. So I'm sorry, I'm not helping very much. Yeah, I don't think I have what I'm looking for, which is a short recording. But anyway, that's as much as I have. 
So I next time I go, maybe Nicholas will go and investigate and see if we can find out what it is, <laughs> where it came from. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'd be glad to try. So we have another question. Um, my ancestors were Acadians who had friendly connections with Mi Mi'kmaq, mm -hmm. original residents in Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Is there any similarity or connection with your culture or language? Do you want to answer that, Nicholas? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure when it comes to the um, the connection to the Mi'kmaq culture with uh, the Inuit culture, but I'm sure that um, as many indigenous communities do have similar connections, um, like when people would have arrived from from away, right? And it's very important to uh, to learn about that, but. I'm not sure if there is a connection to the language that I know of, mm -hmm. other than that, of course, in our province, it is very important to know that um, it's, a, it's the homeland of both Inuit and Mi'kmaq, although it's kind of, there's kind of a big distance between Newfoundland and Labrador, where um, Inuit were predominantly from Labrador and Mi'kmaq, I believe from Newfoundland, but mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. It's very interesting and, important to make that connection. That sort of, I can just say a little bit that I'm from Prince Edward Island, which is also a lot of their Mi'kmaq uh, indigenous uh, communities in Prince Edward Island, in, which is near, you may know, uh, as you may know, Linda, close to um, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, and the Mi'kmaq traveled from there over to Newfoundland. It's quite a ways. It, it takes eight hours on a ferry, on a, on a motorized ferry. So uh, by, by canoe would be, um, I don't know, a little bit longer probably, um, and, and certainly a lot more energy of paddling. And so it's a distance. Um, probably there was some encounters with Inuit and, and Mi'kmaq people, as Nicholas mentioned, um, but they really are kind of different, uh, uh, different sorts of traditions, I would say, um, just from my own knowledge of the Mi'kmaq cultures. But anyway, it's a, it's a neat question, certainly something to follow up. And then Sandra asks, in Hopedale, do they mostly sing traditional hymns or do they also use contemporary music? So in our church services on Sunday, we sing both. And uh, actually from, from my knowledge in the Inukidut service at 10 o'clock, it's all traditional hymns. And a lot of the songs that are sung are from what we call the litany, the uh, liturgies and the melodies songs um, with the melody numbers. But in um, in our English service at 11 o'clock, we often sing both contemporary music and also every now and then a, a song from the hymn book, a traditional song. Yeah. And Nicholas wanted to learn to play like the deer, I think. So they, they know there is some, the Nistrum song. So. They, they do have some contemporary things in the English service. Neat. Definitely. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. Uh, looks like that was the last one. Okay. Uh, I want to thank both of you on behalf of the Hymn Society for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, thank our participants for hanging in there, even though we started just a tad late. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, again, just thank you very much, David and Nicholas and Valerie for just a very informative um, and fascinating presentation. I, as I said, I learned a lot tonight and I'm sure that the participants also learned something new as well. Yeah, Kumik, and uh, please know that this tradition is alive and well. It's not about history, it's about something living and continuing and, uh, um, there should be lots more to, to learn. So we only gave you a tiny snippet, I think. Um, so I'll leave the last word to Nicholas, maybe uh, to close us off with uh, a greeting from the, from the wonderful community that we love so much, you and both and I. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. And I'd like to thank everyone, including the Hymn Society for hosting this event. And thank you to a wonderful teacher, David Bewley. 
So I'm looking forward to the future and knowing that this tradition will continue in our communities. Daima, that's all for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.